It's the Revelation chapter 6. <coughs> and I still have just this congestion, right? Just sort of right in here. And uh, it bugs me from some time to time, so I appreciate your prayers for that and a bunch of other things. All right, Revelation chapter 6. We're, get, we're going to open up the sixth seal. And to me, um, this is a huge event that takes place here. I mean, it is, it is huge. And how many times the Bible references what we're going to see at the opening of the sixth seal. I don't know that I'll be able to cover it all. But you know me, I'm going to try. So Revelation 6, verse 12, John said, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal. Lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became, how? As blood. Now, who remembers this four blood moons nonsense that went around. Okay. John Hagee wrote a book on it. A couple of other people wrote a book on it. They made a lot of money off those books. They made a lot of money off the videos. They laid, made a lot of money off marketing this idea that four blood moons together signals some sort of plan of prophecy that God has in the Bible for Israel. And it's like they were aiming at this deer here like this. Because they missed it big time. And um, I don't know exactly what the Bible means when it says it became as blood or... I think there's another pr uh, place. We'll probably have it. I'll probably have it in my notes. Where the Bible says the sun or the the moon was turned to blood. Okay, so I don't know exactly what all that means. I just know that when we see it, we're going to go. That's what he was talking about. Okay. So anyway, verse thirteen. The, uh, in verse 12 again, the sun became black as sackcloth of hair and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell onto the earth. And what are the stars of heaven? What are they? How does the Bible identify them? Angels. Every time. Every time. The Bible refers to stars as angels. Now... I don't understand that, but I believe it. We know that there is, and this is funny, back, I don't know, five, six hundred years ago, an astronomer came out and said that he had calculated that there was nearly, nearly 1,100 stars in the heavens. 1,100. Boy, did he get that wrong. He couldn't see beyond what it, his eyes could pick up at night. He couldn't see what, what else was there. After they invented a telescope and they started looking up for the first time, they're seeing stars they never even knew were there. So then they bumped it up to, I don't know, something like 20, 30,000, something, something like that. When the Hubble Space Telescope, telescope was sent up, it was, they took a, they aimed the Hubble telescope to an empty spot in the sky. Just an empty place where they couldn't see that there was anything there. And they aimed it there and they left the shutter open all that time. I think it was a couple weeks, something like that. And the picture that they got returned back to them showed that in this little bitty spot where they didn't think anything was there, Brother George, it was 
full of galaxies. Galaxies are the cluster of stars where there could be as many as a billion stars per galaxy. And every dot, everything you can see on there, you also see something that Einstein came up with, uh, and that is called gravitational lensing. There is something in, the, in that photograph that causes the light behind it to bend and go around that object. It must be a large black hole or something like that. And it's forcing the light that should be coming directly to our eyes. It's forcing it around that object. And it looks just like a, like a lens, a fisheye lens. You really ought to come to church more often. I, I'm just loaded with this stuff. Because that, that's a, that was always a big question to me. I would think years ago, this must be some like meteor shower. Because stars can all fall down from heaven onto the earth, can they? Well, if you believe that these stars are angels, then it becomes easy to believe that. Okay, and we'll get, we'll get there. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, verse 13, even as a fig tree casteth untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. Think about that. What was it they heard on the day of Pentecost? A rushing mighty wind. In verse 14, And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. In other words, God just basically took the universe and rolled it up as a scroll. Um, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. There's a prophecy that goes with that. Let's see. Nope, I don't have it in my notes here. Uh, so we'll have to go to it. Uh, but anyway, verse 14 again, the heaven departed as the scroll went in his roll together and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. The wrath of the lamb. Because we know that when Christ comes marching in, in Revelation 19, he is coming to make war with the inhabitants of this earth, the beast, the false prophet, all of those who have the mark, and so on. He's coming with ten thousands of his saints to wage war on this planet. And here's how I have it pictured. It is the shortest war Ever. Amen? Because there isn't an army big enough to stand against the army of the Lord. Somebody say amen. Uh, let's see here. Verse 17, for the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? Now it says, let's go back to um, verse 14. Verse 14. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Take your Bible, turn to Isaiah, exactly, Jared, Isaiah 40. See, he said it. Isaiah 40. Isaiah has how many chapters in it? 66. Okay? The Bible has 66 books in it. And here's what's interesting. In Isaiah 40, you have the prophecy of, the, of John the Baptist preparing the way and the prophecy of Jesus writing in. The first time we see that in the New Testament is in the 40th book of the Bible, which is Matthew. 
Okay, it's 39 in the old and um, 27 in the new. Um, I'm going to ask somebody for two things. Number one, could I get some water? And number two, does anybody have like a mint or something with sugar in it? Yeah. Pass it forward. I'll take it all. Thank you. Oh, if I had diet, what is it, diet Pepsi? Oh, thank you for that. If I had diet Pepsi, I could put this in, or diet Coke, is it? You put Mentos in? Yeah. I can start to feel my blood sugar go down, so bear with me. Uh, where did I tell you to go? I, Isaiah 40? Watch this. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people saith your God. Why did God say that twice? Go ahead. Do what? Got it. The comforter is the Holy Spirit. You could look at it like this. When you need comfort from the Bible, you could get it from this part of the Bible, the Old Testament, or you could get it from this part of the Bible, the New Testament. Either way, God is going to give you comfort from this book. You didn't spit in it, did you? Yep. Candy too. All right. I'm, Lisa. Whoops. I'm loaded down. Um, but he said... Let me finish this. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem. Comfortably refers, number one, to the Holy Spirit. He's the comforter. And you mentioned the first and second outpouring, the double blessing. When Elijah was received into heaven, Elisha wanted one thing, and that was a double portion of the spirit that was on Elijah. And did he get it? Absolutely. So there is coming to the people of Israel the second outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I can show you that in scriptures in a minute. Okay? So that's number one. And then, of course, when it says, Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem, the word comfort is also associated with the Bible, that we through patience and comfort of scriptures might have hope. I don't have to tell you, because I've already told you many times, how many times I've had to go to this Bible on certain days, read it, Meditate on it, think on it, just to be able to make it through that day. And it works. It absolutely works. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished. And I want to sing this because this is part of uh, Handel's Messiah. This is the first song that's in there. That her iniquity is pardoned. Look at there. For she hath received of the Lord's hand what? It says it right there, doesn't it? Double for all her sins. In other words, Israel is going to receive the double portion, the double blessing, the second outpouring of the Spirit of God. And then, verse 3, the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord and make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be, ex watch this, every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough places plain and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. I believe that that is the rapture day. The glory of the Lord being revealed. I could be wrong. But that's what I get out of that. 
Because in Matthew 24, Jesus told him, and then shall he send his angels um, with power and great glory to gather together his saints. Um, let's see here. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. The voice said, cry. And he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass and all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. My wife and I went out shopping yesterday and when we pulled in our driveway, uh, we've got some new neighbors that live in the, in the mobile home in front of us. And where the mobile home tongue comes out of, you know, this thing, we come home one day and all of a sudden these beautiful flowers were in there. And I thought, man, those are lovely. And I never thought no more about it. And when we pulled in yesterday, my wife said, you know what? We ought to do what she did. And I said, what's that? Pull up all the flowers out of our flower garden and put fake ones in there. I didn't know they were fake. But that's not bad, right? I like it. They won't have to get out and pull them nasty prickly thorns out of it all the time. Uh, all flesh is grass and the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth because the spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth. But the word of our God shall stand for how long? Forever the word of our God. At any time you find the phrase, the word of God, it always speaks of the collection of every word that God gave to the prophets, to David, to Moses, the words that Jesus said, the apostles, and so on. When he mentions the word of God, he is referring to the Bible in its singular fashion. It, this, is, this is not some truth. This book is all truth. Amen? Thank you for that, Jared. He's amen me like crazy this morning. I like that. Yeah. You do. And I'll, and I'll teach you something that's going to be neat. Okay? When you were, when you were born, what is the first thing, they don't do this anymore, but when you were born, what was the first thing the doctor did to you? And why did they do, make sure you what? Make sure you what? Breathe. Breathe. Air. Spirit. Remember, this is the temple. When Moses built the tabernacle, God blessed that tabernacle by his very presence in it. When Solomon built his temple, God adorned and blessed that temple because the Spirit of God came rushing in to that temple and that's life. And you can tell whether or not a baby is good or not so good if he's born and all of a sudden the spirit, the life, the air enters into him and fills both of his lungs and he begins to cry. That's how it is in the spiritual realm when you are born again. The Holy Ghost enters into you right then and there because you are the temple of the living God. Isn't that neat? So go home, spank your little kids and say, that's the Holy Spirit. Um, 
That's really all I wanted to cover here in, in uh, Isaiah 40. But here's why I wanted to say that. Is that John sees it here in Revelation 6. That in verse 14, every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Who remembers uh, watching Mount St. Helens collapse? I will never forget. I was, I, that fascinated me for some reason. I came home, watched that on television one day. I'm going, whoa! The whole mountain in less than about 10 seconds was gone. Whole side of the mountain. Anytime God gets near the earth, the earth quakes. The prophecy here is, is that every low place, every valley, is going to be exalted, which means lifted up. And every mountain is going to be shaken and brought down so that the entire world contains nothing but Pure land, no hills, no valleys, no ditches, no mountains, nothing like that. God's going to do what? Illinois. Illinois, yeah. Yeah, or Kansas, yeah. It'd be hard pressed to find a mountain over there. But anyway, that's what I believe he's going to do on that day. Now, Matthew chapter 24. <clears throat> And again, um, I have been doing a series, the Watchman video broadcast, about Matthew chapter 24. And some people agree with me, others don't. And I respect their belief, as long as they believe the King James, that's fine. Had a young pastor came to visit here several years ago and he'd been watching our ministry and, and he said, there, I got to ask you a question. He said, I, I have pastor friends in the ministry. And he said, the way you teach the rapture and the timing of it, uh, Pastor Mike, he said, I like it because that's really how I think it's going to happen. But I have a lot of pastor friends who don't, who they, they won't listen. They won't even listen to me contradict them or try to correct them or try to say, hey, look at this differently, um, their doctrine of the rapture. And, um, and he said, I know these are good men. And he said, I've sat under their ministry. I've listened to their sermons. I've heard them preach. I know these guys preach the word of God and they have the word of God in them. But how is it that I can believe in this so strongly and yet they can believe in something else just as strong. And I said to him this. I said, when you were conceived, your mother's womb, all the cells were alike for the first 10, 12 weeks, something like that. But after a while, and you see it in the book of Acts, after a while, cell differentiation come, kicks in. And some of those cells that are being made automatically start pumping. And the reason why they're doing that is because they're heart cells. And there are heart cells and nerve cells and bone cells and blood cells and all kinds of cells in your body that they all come from the same DNA. But God made each one of them different, didn't he? And I said, your, your pastor friends, if you love them and you know these men are good men, you hang on to them. Because it's hard to get good friends nowadays. I said, but not, I wouldn't necessarily try to change them. Maybe God doesn't want them that way. Maybe for God's purpose and his plan for their ministry, God has them doing a different thing in a different way than what you're doing or what I'm doing, so on and so on and so on. He said, that made a lot of sense. 
Um, and so when it comes to this idea of when the rapture is going to happen, first let me clear something up for you. I do not believe that you will be able to find any reference in Scripture to a seven-year tribulation. I've never seen it. I've never found it. I've looked. It's not there. And Jesus said these words, Matthew 24, 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days. He didn't say months. He didn't say years. He said days. And he said, this is what's going to happen. The sun shall be darkened. Well, that's what John saw in Revelation 6. The moon shall not give her light. John saw that too. And the stars shall fall from heaven. John saw that too, didn't he? So all three things here. The sun is darkened. The moon does not give her light. There are, it's sort of a split. There's some verses and references that say the moon became as blood. And other references that says the moon was darkened or did not give out her light. And the stars shall fall from heaven. So, in my opinion, that places this event as being prior to the, to the, to the rapture. Okay? Um, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. If we go back and look in Revelation 6, look at what happened. He, he, and I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, no, there was a great earthquake. A great earthquake. And the earth is going to quake and shake. And then... In verse 13, the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the writer of Hebrews, who I believe was Paul, mentioned this. He said, yet once more, and I will not only shake the earth, but I will shake the earth and the heavens as well, so that anything remaining standing up, those are, those are mine. Your picture of that is, of course, in the plain of Dura, when Nebuchadnezzar set up that 666 image. 60 cubits tall, 6 cubits wide. He set up an image. Basically, it's a foreshadowing of the Antichrist. And he says, when you hear the music, fall down and worship this. So he's got probably two, 300,000 people in this one valley and this, the music sounds and everybody falls to the ground. Now, how hard is it to see three guys standing up? Go get those guys right there. And that's what happened. Um, but everything fell except for those three men. God had blessed them so that they can never fall. See, they believed that God would save them from ever going into that fiery furnace. But they said this, even if he chooses not to save us from going in that fiery furnace, we are still not going to bow down to your image. That's resolve. Amen? That is resolve. That was the bell. Let me read through this very quickly. Um... Verse 30, then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Then all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet from one end of heaven to the other. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. A lot of scholars say, now the fig tree is Israel. But it doesn't say that. In fact, in I think it's Luke. In Luke's version of this sermon, he has Jesus as saying, um, consider, now learn a parable of the fig tree and of every other tree. So it's not just the fig tree. 
And some have used this to say when the fig tree blossoms, then that generation is going to see the rapture. So lo and behold, 1947, um, the Israelites were given permission to take that land and live in it. Ratified somewhere in 1947, 1948, something like that. And you had all these prophecy guys going, okay, the rapture is going to be in 40 years because that's a generation. Well, it didn't happen. Okay, it's just like we said, the rapture is going to happen 70 years from that date because that's a, that's a generation and it didn't happen. And they keep changing the story because we haven't been raptured yet. So obviously to me, the parable of the fig tree is not about the budding of Israel. Here's what it is. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and put it forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So likewise, here's what, the, here's what the fig tree means. When ye shall see these things, know that it is near even at the doors. That's what, this, that's what the symbolism of the fig tree was. He said it right here. This is what it is. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass pass away aren't you glad of that amen because one of these days you're going to get sick and tired of me but at least you'll have your bible amen let's go to the lord in prayer and say amen father thank you lord for your blessings your grace your mercy Father, I thank you, Lord, for these people and all the good people online, all of those, Lord, who serve you, all of my good preacher friends. They may disagree with me on this subject or that subject or the subjects I disagree with, but Father, they're my friends, and I don't have very many of those. Pray, Lord, that you would bless your men all over this world who are preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ people the way, the truth, the life. We would fill our minds and our hearts with the things that we learn from this book. Bless the word this morning. These sayings, Father, in our hearts. We look forward to the day of your appearing, Father. We ask this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen.